All right, let's get going. This is um, a webinar presented by Forays and Pixelate, and it, the topic is what's coming in 2022 with COPPA compliance, safety, and privacy in advertising. I'd like to start by just um, providing a little bit of uh, administrative inf admin, uh, information. Um, so this webinar is being recorded and it will be available um, on the 4A's website um, under their uh, webinar series, Business as Unusual. Um, we'll be taking questions during the webinar. So if you, if you have questions, please feel free to um, use the Q&A feature um, on the Zoom screen bar. And, and please go ahead and, and put questions in as they come to you. There's, there's no need to wait until the end, although we will likely be addressing all the questions um, at the end. So I am Allison Lafrac. Um, I am the SVP of Public Policy, Ads, Privacy, and COPPA Compliance at Pixelate. And prior to coming to Pixelate, I spent 10 years at the Federal Trade Commission, uh, first in the Division of Privacy and Identity Protection, um, bringing privacy and data security, security enforcement actions. Um, and then in the Office of International Affairs, um, still uh, doing privacy work, um, but um, on an international scope, um, working with other data protection authorities um, globally. I'd like to introduce my two fellow panelists. Mamie Cresses is Vice President of the Children's Advertising Review Unit, KRU, of BBB National Programs. She also leads KRU's COPPA Safe Harbor Program and oversees the organization's monitoring and enforcement actions. Before joining KRU, Mamie was also at the FTC. She was a senior attorney in the FTC's Division of Advertising Practices, where she led consumer protection and regulatory law enforcement actions. She was also involved in rulemakings, including the 2012 revisions to the COPPA rule. Allison Pepper currently serves as the Executive Vice President of Government Relations at the American Association of Advertising Agencies, 4As. She works with regulators, legislators, and industry stakeholders on issues of importance to the advertising community. Prior to working at 4As, Allison served as the Assistant General Counsel and Senior Director of Public Policy at the IAB, the Interactive Advertising Bureau. So welcome Mimi and Allison. The Association of National Advertisers estimates that worldwide programmatic advertising spending exceeded $200 billion in 2021, and digital media now accounts for more than half of all global ad spending. The ANA also estimates that roughly 30% of that spending were unwittingly goes to nefarious or fraudulent ad schemes. So ad fraud is a, is a huge problem, especially in CTV and mobile apps. The programmatic media buying ecosystem lacks transparency and accountability, and it has become a breeding ground for consumer and children's online privacy abuses. Pixelate is a global ad supply chain risk management platform that provides data, research, and technology to solve these problems for our ad tech customers. Pixelate office offers an accredited service for the detection and filtration of sophisticated invalid traffic across desktop, mobile web, mobile in-app, and CTV advertising. And I'm gonna turn it over now to Mamie to um, provide a little bit of information about Cairo. Thank you, Allison, and thank you for having me here today. Um, for those of you who aren't already really familiar with KRU, it's the Children's Advertising Review Unit of the Better Business, 
BBB national programs, excuse me. So what does KRU do? We are an independent self-regulatory organization. We work with businesses to ensure that uh, advertising and privacy practices directed to children uh, currently defined uh, under our guidelines as children under age 13 are uh, accurate, appropriate, uh, and um, positive, uh, you know, healthy for children. Um, what does that mean? That means that we, uh, we both work with businesses who choose to uh, use our pre-screening services before they run advertisements to help uh, ensure that uh, there's nothing wrong there, uh, nothing misleading, nothing that violates our guidelines. We also independently monitor the marketplace for advertising and privacy practices. So in the area of privacy specifically, KRU has, in fact, uh, brought over 200 COPPA-related investigations. Many of those investigations uh, have, have led to significant improvements in the marketplace with regard to uh, COPPA compliance, but also truthfulness, transparency, and accuracy in how uh, companies relay their privacy practices to, to parents. And in addition, KRU has on occasion where companies have uh, declined to participate in the self-regulatory process or to make changes, has referred those matters to the Federal Trade Commission. So three or four of the, the FTC's highly visible COPPA actions were in fact started by referrals from KRU, and that includes the case against Musical.ly several years ago, uh, which was then bought by TikTok, so you all know it as, as the case against TikTok. Um, um, so we also, KRU also um, operates the, um, the first and longest running FTC approved COPPA safe harbor. And what that is, is a business can sign up with KRU to, help, to have KRU um, help them uh, become COPPA compliant and certify their products as COPPA compliant. So you have that added assurance that you've had extra eyes by an FTC approved entity in helping you comply with the law. Um, that I think wraps up a basic introduction to what we do in the privacy sphere. Thanks, Mamie. So just to lay the groundwork here, uh, Congress enacted COPPA to address the rapid growth of online marketing techniques in the 1990s that were targeting kids. Um, at this time, programmatic advertising was just taking off. It was the very early days of targeted ad placement. Um, and at that time, the websites were collecting personal information from kids without obtaining, well, without parental knowledge and without parental consent. So in response, Congress passed COPPA. Um, and more than 20 years later, this is the law in the U.S. that, that governs the collection of children's information. Um, so a lot has happened since then, obviously, with the advent of uh, smartphones and apps and CTV and all of that. So we'll talk later in the program about some of the current proposals to update COPPA and enact new legislation in this space. Um, so Congress charged the FTC with um, uh, uh, putting out a rule to implement COPPA. And that rule came into effect in 2000. And the FTC began enforcing the rule against operators of websites and video games. Um, the rule was updated in 2012. And at that time, the definition of personal information under the rule was revised to include persistent identifiers that could recognize users over time um, across different web websites and online services. So it was this particular uh, revision to the COPPA rule that trigger triggered um, a marked increase in ad tech companies liability under the rule. 
Um, and so since this revision, the FTC has been enforcing it um, against ad tech companies and platforms. So um, in cases like uh, the 2019 settlement with Google and YouTube for $170 million, the, the largest COPPA settlement, um, and cases against ad tech companies like Inmobi and OpenX, which I'll touch on um, briefly in a moment. So um, just as a re uh, reminder to the audience, um, third parties in the ad tech ecosystem are subject to COPPA's requirements um, if they have actual knowledge that they're collecting personal information directly from users of another website or online service that's directed to kids under 13. And the, penal the civil penalties that companies can face under COPPA can be very high. There's a per penalty violation amount of $46,000 and um, violations can be calculated in such a way that the, the, the um, final penalty number can be very high. Um, and so the bottom line is that companies really cannot afford um, to screw this up. So COPPA compliance is, is a critical issue um, uh, for ad tech companies to be focusing on right now. I wanted to talk briefly about the most recent COPPA case that the FTC brought along with the Department of Justice. And this was the case against um, Weight Watchers and its subsidiary Curbo. Um, earlier this month over allegations that they marketed a weight loss app for kids um, and then collected their users' personal information without parental consent. So the, the app tracks food intake, activity, and weight, um, and it collected collects personal information such as the user's name, email address, birth date, um, and other information. Uh, and, it, and the app was not obtaining verifiable parental consent as required by COPPA in order to collect those types of information from children. So users were able to register for the app by either indicating that they were a parent and they were signing up their child or by indicating that they were over 13 and signing up themselves. Um, and the FTC alleged that the way the signup process was designed encouraged users to falsely claim they were over 13 because there was no option to indicate that you were under 13. You either indicated that you were a parent or you were over 13. Um, the FTC also pointed to evidence that after registering as over 13, hundreds of users changed their birth dates on their profiles to indicate that they were in fact under 13. Um, so that gave Curbo actual knowledge that there were users under 13 on the app. Um, and, and with that actual knowledge, Curbo should have removed these under 13 users immediately, um, but it failed to do so and the users were able to continue using the app. Um, finally, uh, the FTC alleged that Curbo failed to implement a viable um, parent verification method to, so to confirm that, it, that parents were providing consent. So the settlement requires um, the companies to pay $1.5 million in a civil penalty and to delete um, any of the data that was obtained um, unlawfully. So the key takeaways from, from this settlement are um, first, this is the, the first case where the FTC has challenged a non-neutral age gate. Um, so um, as I said, you know, that the, the age gate um, only had two options, either you're a parent or you're over 13, and there was no option to indicate that you were under 13. Um, so the FTC has said, if, if you're a child-directed app, it, um, you know, the, these age gates um, must be neutral and there can't be language or nudges um, tipping the user off to, to choose that they're above 13. Uh, another key takeaway is that even if a product or app is purportedly directed to parents, like this one had an option for a parent assisting a child using the app, if it is still intended for use by kids, COPPA still applies. Um, the FTC also emphasized the need to have reasonable data retention policies in place 
um, requiring the company to not only delete data, data that was collected after a year, but also requiring the company to delete or destroy any models or algorithms that were developed using the personal information from kids. Um, so the final takeaway is that this case is really indicative of a trend um, that started with uh, the Cambridge Analytica case, as well as the case against the photo app Ever Album, that has the FTC requiring these companies to disgorge algorithms that are based on data that was obtained unlawfully. Um, and so this remedy should be expected now um, wherever it, it, it may be applicable. I'd like to talk briefly about the OpenX um, settlement. So this settlement occurred at the end of last year. Um, this was with the online advertising platform OpenX, um, and the FTC alleged that the company collected personal information from kids in violation of COPPA, um, and also that it collected geolocation information from users who had asked not to be tracked. I want to focus on the COPPA allegations in my remarks. Um, the FTC's investigation found that OpenX um, had reviewed uh, hundreds of child-directed apps. Um, these apps had terms in the description that identified the intended audience as four kids or four toddlers um, and included age ratings that indicated these apps were appropriate for children under 13. So because these apps were not uh, flagged as child directed, OpenX passed the data on to third parties that used it to target ads to, to um, users of these child directed apps. Um, because OpenX had traffic quality analysts reviewing these apps and making these assessments, um, it was deemed to have actual knowledge that the apps in the ad exchange were child directed. Um, uh, this case resulted in a $2 million settlement that also required OpenX to delete all ad request data that it had collected to serve targeted ads um, and to implement, implement a comprehensive privacy program to ensure that it complies with COPPA going forward. And the key takeaways from this settlement, um, first of all, I think this case sent a very strong signal to the ad tech industry. Um, it was a reminder of third-party liability under COPPA. Even if your company is not consumer-facing, you have obligations under COPPA. Um, I think it, the, the case also reminds companies to take a, a fresh look at what you're collecting periodically um, and whether or not it's permissible for you to gather that data um, and to re-examine your business re reasons for having that data um, on a regular basis. The settlement um, specifically required OpenX to re-review apps on a periodic basis to identify additional child-directed apps and to ban them from the company's ad exchange. It also required the company to keep track of which apps and websites had been banned or removed from its exchange. Um, so I, I'd like to just talk briefly about the COPPA rule itself and the fact that it is currently in the process of um, uh, being reviewed by the FTC. The FTC opened um, this, this review process in 2019. Um, you know, they held a, a workshop um, and also solicited public comments. So at this point, um, the comments are being digested, and the next step in this process is going to be um, the agency issuing a um, proposed rule revision, um, followed by uh, an additional um, comment period. So that's um, something to definitely keep an eye on. Um, and I'd like to also um, just touch briefly on the um, a, a new product that Pixelate is rolling out, um, which is an automated methodology for ad tech companies to use to assess whether apps are child directed. Um, and, and the methodology is based on the factors outlined in the COPPA rule um, for assessing whether or not an app is child directed. Um, and, and 
the goal here is really to make this information publicly available. So if you go to ratings.pixelate.com, you can search for any app in the App Store um, in, in Google Play or the Apple App Store. Um, we have this information for over 8 million apps. Um, and you'll you'll for each for the each app, you will be taken to an app insights page. And anyone um, can use this publicly free of charge. And you can see the COPPA audience as either child-directed or general audience um, as assessed using um, our automated methodology. Um, there's also other important information about the app, uh, such as whether or not Pixelate was able to detect a privacy policy, um, and also whether or not the app is um, passing certain pieces of information like uh, IP data or geolocation data. Um, we also present some basic information about the app's programmatic advertising, such as authorized sellers of the app. Um, and the, the last thing I'd, I'd like to note before I turn it over to Mamie is that earlier this month, um, Pixelate released a report which analyzed the nearly 400,000 child-directed apps in the app stores. And these that number comes from um, our automated methodology that was used to assess whether or not apps are child directed. Um, and so the report summarizes some of our findings. Um, we found that about 40% of child directed apps can access some type of personal information. Um, over 5% of child directed apps um, transmit personal information, including GPS and IP in the digital ad supply chain. Um, we also found that, that there was a um, pretty large discrepancy between child-directed apps that had a detectable privacy policy um, with 12% of the child-directed act, apps in Google Play having no detectable privacy policy, and the number is nearly two times that, 22% um, in the Apple App Store that had no uh, detectable privacy policy. Um, so you can get more information about this report and also other reports that, that we've put out um, and downloaded at our website, and that's at pixelate.com slash reports. And with that, I would like it, I would like to turn it over to Mamie. Thank you, Allison. Um, first, I um I do want to tell you about our most recent COPPA case here at KRU, but I, I also wanted to uh, echo a lot of the really major important part points that um, Allison made regarding COPPA and why it is important to all businesses. Uh, and that is because, you know, if you are, say, an SDK or something like that, you, you can be held responsible. And I think when you look at the OpenX case, it may be natural to say, well, maybe OpenX should not have done so much to learn about the apps uh, where it was being placed. And I, I just want to caution as someone who also had worked at the FTC forever and worked on the COPPA uh, rule for many, many years that I think as we move forward, um, we are going to see the FTC uh, taking a, a much closer look at third parties on, on, on cooperative arrangements between uh, app developers, websites, third party programming, because there, there's almost no products now that don't have sort of companies layered on top of each other in the offerings. And so hiding your head in the sand is, is not the way to go. And as you can see, um, OpenX ultimately has a, a COPPA order against them that requires very strenuous record keeping and monitoring for, K for COPPA. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about a case that uh, KRU brought. As I mentioned, we do, uh, KRU has, a, has privacy, children's privacy guidelines um, that are uh, in sync with COPPA and we do do our own monitoring of the marketplace. We recently brought a decision against a company called TikTok. Uh, TikTok makes a, a phone, an app, a uh, connected smartphone for children. It's advertised to kids five to 12 years old as a safer alternative 
to other phones out there. Um, and what we found is that TikTok uh, did not provide clear, complete, and most importantly, non-confusing information to parents about just what information that phone is going to collect from children once you turn it over to your child uh, prior to parents purchasing the device. Like, uh, like the way the um, Kerbo case that Allison just discussed, this case also stands for the proposition that um, even if the transaction begins with the parent, so even if your, your initial audience is the parent, if you're going to ultimately collect information from children, you must comply with COPPA. Uh, and it further stands for the proposition that, in fact, if you have the parent's attention right at the start, you actually have a beautiful opportunity to provide them with very clear, comprehensive uh, information on your privacy practices. Uh, and TikTok failed to do that here. Uh, there were a lot of conflicting and confusing and contradictory statements a lot of sales information and not a lot of clear information on privacy. Beyond that point though, there is another point that I think is important, which is that um, self-regulation in the COPPA sphere works, right? We reached out to TikTok uh, because we saw these practices. Um, the company was eager to work with KRU to, to improve its practices, to come into compliance with COPPA. And so uh, it was an efficient means of, of securing more privacy protections for children without litigation uh, and without a protracted process. Um, I think that's, if we can move to the next slide now. So, um, I don't think I have to tell anybody that this is the year uh, where children's privacy and children's wellness have become front and center in our national debate. Uh, and I think that's important because there are a number of initiatives in play and, uh, and everybody needs to, to pay attention and to think about um, what makes sense from, a, from the children's perspective, what makes sense from uh, practical perspectives, how businesses can do their best for children. So as you probably know, um, the calls for change in, uh, in online content that children access come all the way from the top. President Biden raised it in the State of the Union. Uh, he has asked for uh, time to strengthen privacy protections, ban targeted advertising to children, demand tech companies stop collecting personal data on our children. Um, while the focus has been uh, very heavily on tech companies or big tech, I think these calls for changes in the way that we protect children's privacy and also in the way that we uh, market to children uh, apply to all businesses. Anyone who is on the web, or you know, in the metaverse, or making mobile apps. Um, if your your audience uh, includes children or teens, uh, you need to be paying attention. So, in that regard, if we go to the next slide, um, there are a number of bills out there um, de dealing with children's privacy. Um, and children's wellness. I'm not going to go into great depth on any of them, only to highlight that uh, there is, there's a lot of interest. And the interest ranges from bills to uh, modify, to revise COPPA to include children above the age of 12. So right now, COPPA requires that before you collect personal information from children under it, 12 and younger that you get parents' permission. Some of the bills here would in fact change the COPPA age to as high as 16, um, and that would require parental permission before collecting information from children up to, you know, through age 15. 
Um, other bills are modeled more along the lines of uh, what um, the age appropriate design code that we've seen come out of the UK, which um, says that children generally in that age 13 to 16 or 13 to 17, depending on what bill you look at, that those children should have added privacy protections as well as added protections against uh, either patterns in the media that they're watching that can lead to, um, you know, put them at greater risk um, or privacy collection data practices. Uh, and those law, those proposed bills would require such things as an opt-in that children 16, 13 to 17 or sometimes different ages, that those children would have, you the companies would have to get opt in consent from those children before uh, either collecting PII uh, personal information or sometimes the definition is before selling personal information. Um, some of those bills also would ban behavioral targeting to any children um, under 18. And there's a lot of questions raised by the bills as to how these mechanisms would be in fact carried out, you know, how uh, in most instances, uh, federal bills are going to turn to the FTC uh, to do the enforcement of these um, laws. But there are real questions about um, how to balance between younger and older children, uh, and especially questions about uh, if we're going to raise the age, the CASA age. I think uh, there's a very practical question as to how that would work um, given uh, someone, someone had put in the chat a little while ago a question, um, how, how do the big companies uh, know if they have children or not, don't children, can't children lie about their age? Um, that is certainly something that um, the FTC has uh, been aware of for many, many years in, in bringing COPPA cases. Uh, if the age range is changed, that will that will be a factor as well, um, because I think that children, older children, certainly uh, know how to circumvent their parents, and that raises uh, a very important point that Allison actually raised with one of the cases, which is that for companies that uh, don't want children on their sites that claim to be general audience and that use age screens, not only do the age screens need to be neutral, but it's not enough, honestly, to just have an age screen. You're also going to need to take steps on the back end to ensure that if, if, you, if you really don't want children there, if you're not getting their parents' consent, uh, that you are taking steps on the back end to monitor what's going on and to um, close children's accounts when you find them. Uh, it's not enough to just bury your head in the sand there. Um, so let's see, you know, the other area of, of these federal laws is, is also in the wellness area. So we're seeing uh, federal proposals. We're seeing uh, a lot of measures that go beyond what we traditionally think of privacy as, uh, as information collection but also proposed to, to ban auto settings, to ban likes and follower accounts, to um, ban the use of algorithms, which is yet to be defined what exactly they mean by that. Uh, and some of the bills like the COSA bill, which I have at the bottom of the slide here, um, would give parents and children, so teens and their parents, uh, the ability to set, um, for instance, parental controls, default settings that are stricter, um, and things like that. And it's yet to be determined how, how that balancing act would work in those instances between parents and children. Uh, so there's a lot, a lot to pay attention to here. Um, and on the next slide, um, just this week, we know that um, Utah just uh, passed privacy legislation. So that's bringing us to um, four states that have privacy legislation that includes some reference to children or teens. Um, 
And, you know, the California law obviously uh, has gotten the most attention that is mirrored on this um, age appropriate design code coming out of the UK. Uh, it defines a child as eight as under 18, uh, but it gives those rights, it gives responsibilities to platforms and other online services to provide uh, rights and choice to users, and then it gives teens the right to control uh, the collection and use of their information. And, uh, and then we've got some other states that are on the way, uh, you know, they have bills in varying states of flux. Um, some of those bills also um, uh, go beyond the COPPA um, actual knowledge standard. So under COPPA, if, you, if a site that isn't directed to children uh, gains actual knowledge that children are on the site, then COPPA comes into play and you must take appropriate actions. Some of these state bills go a little further. They include that actual knowledge standard, but also add a willfully disregard standard. So there's still, uh, it still remains to be seen how the law would flesh out on that willfully disregards. Um, but it, it, it could be a significant um, change over COPPA. Okay, so let's see, next slide. Um, a few other things that are going on in the children's privacy space right now, uh, in addition to um, congressional interest in, in either revising COPPA or adding other laws to cover teens, um, there has been uh, urging by Congress uh, to the FTC to um, use COPPA and to use its general unfair and deceptive practices authority to monitor the big tech companies, to look into virtual reality and possible harms related to uh, children's wellness and privacy in those regards. Uh, and there have also been calls to um, take a hard look at the COPPA safe harbor programs of which KRU is, is one. Uh, and I like to think we, we do a good job. Um, but, um, and the reason, the call there uh, is a question of whether uh, the safe harbors are, um, are potentially a rubber stamp to businesses. Um, I would just take a minute, if, if that is a subject that interests you, either because you are uh, a member of a safe harbor program or because you might be considering it. Uh, we did just, KRU did just uh, interview uh, Daniel Kaufman, a uh, former deputy bureau director at the FTC, and Sheila Millar, a, very, a lawyer very active in the self-regulatory process, about their thoughts on the value of safe harbors and whether that part of the law should remain in effect. And I think it's a, it's a terrific discussion of how safe harbors actually, uh, you know, very efficiently economically help to uh, spread COPPA compliance further into new corners uh, and that the programs should in fact uh, stay in place. Um, I think that's it. I, I just, before I stop, I did want to um, uh, also let you know if, if you're interested in KRU's work, uh, either in the advertising space for children or uh, in, in the privacy space, uh, we are, I will make a shameless plug that we are having our annual KRU conference is May 10th and 11th this year. It is all virtual and a lot of the topics that we're talking about here today, you know, compliance with privacy and wellness and safety issues uh, in the metaverse and online spaces uh, will be discussed. So thank you very much. Great, thank you. So thank you to both of my panelists for covering a lot of really important issues on children's privacy. Um, I think, you know, from my perspective that the federal level and certainly at the regulatory level, it's definitely the area that there seems to be the most movement on. It seems to be the area where you do tend to get both sides of the aisle to at least agree that there is a problem, although they might not always agree what the solution to said problem is. 
But for the purposes of the next few slides, I wanna take a step back a little bit from the specificity of the children's privacy issue and just kind of do a bigger picture, 20,000 foot view on some of the big picture privacy issues we're seeing um, a little bit broader than children's privacy. And the first one is a federal update. So federally speaking, you know, I, I've been in the space for a while now. There's been no shortage of bills introduced over the past couple of years. There's been no shortage of hearings. There's been no shortage of subcommittee hearings. We're still not seeing a ton of movement to something actually coming to fruition. Um, some of that is because comprehensive privacy, it's such a big topic. You can agree in principle that comprehensive privacy needs to pass, but when you get down to the actual specifics of what that means for comprehensive privacy, it gets much harder. The debates get much harsher, the hearings get much longer, and it becomes much harder to move anything. Some of it is because some of those issues do devolve into partisan issues. Um, I would say with the comprehensive federal privacy legislation, it's, it's a little bit stalled right now, even though there are quite a few bills pending on Capitol Hill. Some of the big sticking points are the same sticking points that we've seen for years now. Those are sticking points around federal preemption. So will federal law, will any federal privacy law will preempt the state laws that have already passed. And those are of course, California, Colorado, Virginia, and now Utah. And the other big sticking point is will it include a private, act, private right of action? That's a big sticking point as well. You know, there's opportunity with um, compromise areas. You know, there's a lot of compromise and there's a lot of agreement, even bipartisan agreement that the FTC needs more funding, more authority for privacy, um, privacy notices, et cetera. But again, the devil's always in the details on that. And again, we've seen a lot of discrete issues kind of pop up that do seem, seem to subsume the larger, larger conversations around comprehensive privacy. And that's the more discrete issues around Section 230 reform, algorithmic targeting, antitrust competition. Those are all issues that, you know, while they're part of the privacy landscape, they do tend to suck the oxygen out of the larger conversation about comprehensive federal privacy legislation. So I think that's one of the big issues. We're still seeing a lot of stalling on that front. Although that said, we've seen some big ones this year. I think this is an interesting one, this ban surveillance advertising act. You might've seen a little bit about that. There's a house version and then a Senate version. Um, it, is a, it is not a bipartisan bill. This was introduced as a partisan bill. So it's not really clear to me at this point that this particular bill is gonna get a lot of traction just because it, it did not start out as a bipartisan bill. This is a pretty pretty draconian bill. It really does, uh, it does what the title implies. It really wants to go back to a lot of um, contextual and search and really end all forms of targeted or as they like to call it surveillance advertising. Again, it's unlikely that this will move just because of the lack of the bipartisanship nature of it. But there is a lot here that tells you a little bit about where the mindset is on the Hill, at least in one party as they think about these issues. And it's worth pointing out too, and I think this particular issue didn't, maybe didn't get as much press as it could have. That bill, when it was introduced, the Surveillance Targeting Act, it was also a petition that was filed with the Federal Trade Commission in December 2021 by a group called Accountable Tech. And Accountable Tech is um, the, a consumer advocacy group, I guess for lack of a better word, that filed a petition with the FTC that was, I don't think it was verbatim, is the legislation that was introduced uh, in the House and the Senate, but it was pretty close. And the whole goal of it was same thing, basically to, to go back to a very much a search environment and a contextual environment and then end a lot of the uh, targeted advertising practices. Again, it's unclear at this point what exactly the FTC is going to do with this petition. Part of the reason this petition moved at all was because of some rule changes at the FTC about how they received petitions and how they acted on it. So that in and of itself was a new procedure from the FTC. Um, it, it's possible that, or likely even later this spring, the FTC will maybe use some of the information that was on the petition and some of the public commentary that got back to that petition to initiate uh, a rulemaking of some kind. So we'll kind of have to see what type of shape that takes. Uh, the FTC did get quite a few comments, public comments in response to, to the accountable tech petition. So we'll kind of see, but it looks like they probably are moving towards a rulemaking in this area. And then state update, there's more action on the states. Uh, I think we talked about this a little bit, just because of the gridlock we're seeing on the federal level, I think the real action that you're seeing is not surprisingly has been in the states thus far. And you know, I'm not gonna go through this because I feel like if you're on this webinar, you've already been paying attention to the nuances of this. 
of the four bills that we've now seen pass, as I mentioned, these three plus Utah, which just passed, in some ways, I think they've, they've hewn a little bit closer to some of the core issues that this industry cares about. So for the most for the most part, they're not private right of action. California's does have a limited private private right of action around data breach. Um, they they are not the GDPR model of a consent based framework. These are still opt out bills. So on some of the two big issues that I think industry pays a lot of attention to, you have seen some coalescing here. Now there's some divergence and variance, you know, on the edges, um, and that is a compliance issue, and it will continue to be a compliance issue. Uh, Utah was the new one, as I mentioned. One thing that's worth pointing out, and when you think about the state versus the federal, and I know a lot of folks in our industry are very much, well, we would very much like a comprehensive federal privacy bill. We'd very much like it to be a um, federal preemptive bill. It's worth pointing out that you're going to see more states pass privacy laws before you likely see a federal privacy bill. Um, most states wrap up in June. Uh, we're getting close to getting close to that point a little bit here, not too close, but a little bit close. There's still two or three states out there that I would say are a possibility. Massachusetts being one of them for passing new laws. And Massachusetts is different. Massachusetts privacy bill as drafted right now looks different than quite a bit of these. So I think there's still that possibility of um, other states passing privacy bills before the sessions run out in June, summer year round. It's worth, it's worth keeping in mind too, I think in this context that I have heard a little bit of murmurings about, well, what if we get to 25 or 26 states? If 26 is the tipping point, right? What if we get to 26 states that basically are pretty similar and we feel like we can live with them? It's worth keeping in mind always that it's pretty easy in some respects to amend a bill once it's passed on the state level. So just because a bill passes at the state level in its current form doesn't mean you wouldn't have continuing variations and continuing privacies in every state that passed its own version. It's not set in stone and it's not a done deal. So it's another reason that a federal comprehensive privacy law is still uh, effective and a very important goal, I think, for this industry. And then the last thing, private party outlook. You know, we've talked a lot about federal is doing, what regulators are doing, what the state's doing. It's interesting to me that a lot of the changes that I think that we're really having real quarterly results and real quarterly impacts in company are what we're seeing from the private parties. So whether that's, you know, the changes that Apple made in IDFA, with uh, cross app and we saw those results kind of come up when Facebook did their next quarterly results after the changes were made, whether it's Google's announcement um, about the end of cookies and Chrome or the recent announcement about the transition from flock to topics, even though flocks never really came to fruition, we're now, now moving to topics. And the most recent announcement that Google's made about limiting sharing of user data with third parties and Android. Um, it's not really clear how that's gonna play out with Google yet. It, it sounds like maybe at the beginning, it's not going to be exactly the way Apple made their changes to IDFA, but it's not entirely clear how they're going to do that either. And you know, these are big market movers. The changes that the browsers and the operating systems make, these are changes that have very immediate impacts in companies. So I think there's a lot to be learned in seeing what we're seeing in the private party and how that feedback loop might go back to what we see as far as regulation and legislation. But as far as what kind of has the most immediate impact, it's kind of what we're seeing in the private party market a little bit. And then finally, just some thoughts on uh, best practices, new compliance tools. So, you know, based on everything we've talked about in this webinar thus far, it's pretty clear that there's a lot around identity-based targeting, whether it's, you know, children or whether it's at the broader level, 20,000 foot level, a lot of it's under attack or at least under very intense debate with legislators and regulators. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty in the EU, particularly with the Belgium ruling around TCF, new legislation, regulation, litigation, um, the never ending parade of decisions I feel like we're seeing coming out from various EU regulators that are affecting that side of the pond by now, but ideas have a way of crossing the Atlantic and making their way to our legislators and regulators. So it's something to keep an eye on. We have that uncertainty here, as I mentioned. Um, it's not just EU. We do talk about EU because it's one of the largest trading partners for the US, but there's a lot going on in other regions of the world, whether it's South America, uh, Asia, um, Central America, et cetera. There's a lot of changes that are going on with privacy that will affect companies that operate in a multinational global environment. Uh, there does seem to be a growing uh, thought, I think, at least from what I'm seeing, that there's an idea that we really need to diversify our portfolio of how we think about uh, how we think about attribution, how we think about measure, how we think about targeting, how we think about audience acquisition. We really need to think about like, you know, what's the best mix of practices, right? We might have a really good 
way to do contextual here. Targeting might be best in this context. Um, there might be other forms that we can do here. But I think a lot of the feedback that I, I'm hearing increasingly is that whatever the case may be, because there is so much growing uncertainty about what the path forward is going to be, you know, for brands, for agencies, for ad tech, for publishers, for the entire advertising ecosystem, to really think about these issues about um, kind of like how many arrows do we have on our quiver? This might be our contextual error that we use here. This might be our identity error. This might be, you know, experiential, whatever the case may be. I think there's a growing idea that there really needs to be a sense of diversification for how marketers and advertisers think about, um, you know, whether it's acquisition, targeting, attribution, measurement, et cetera, how to think about those issues. So diversification, kind of like your financial portfolio, diversification, I think is important here as well. And with that, I think we um, are moving on to Q&A. So, you know, we've got, I think the first question, uh, well, Mammy, you already addressed the first question a little bit about the gating issue in your comments. So I think we've already addressed that one. The second one, I'm not entirely sure we can answer this, but maybe we can give it a try. So as a third party, not consumer facing, do we have to check the way consent is asked by the app? Could we be responsible if the app is not compliant? That's a good question. Uh, that's a that's a good question, um, and I don't know that anyone has quite uh, asked it that way. So, if what you're saying is, if my uh, ad serving technology is on a site that has identified as a children's site, and may or you know has has identified as for whatever reason you're there, uh, and then it it's determined that uh, in fact that software or whatever might be tracking children. Um, are you responsible if the company had made an effort to obtain parental consent but hadn't done it well? I think that's what the question is. Um, and that that's a great question, but I think uh, that is going to go back to the basic point that uh, you need to take you know, if you only want to serve particular markets and not others, you need to take appropriate steps to give those people who are using your technologies every incentive and opportunity and nudge to tell you which properties fit within a particular model and which don't. And then you need to take steps as well to, uh, you know, to pay attention if things come across your plate that don't look right, uh, you know, maybe something slipped through the cracks, you need to look at that and take action. Um, I know where you're talking about, um, you know, maybe you have thousands and thousands of downloads of a particular uh, technology and, you, you know, monitoring is tough, but you need to satisfy yourself that you're doing enough to catch um, to catch problem areas that, that should be obvious, right? Um, so that issue of if somebody says, I got parental consent to uh, say behaviorally track my users, uh, and then you learn that in fact, their consent was flawed, that, you know, for, for if the FTC were to look at that, if KRU were to look at that, uh, we would be looking at all the factors to say, uh, how good a job have you done here? Or how poor a job have you done here? And that would determine whether or not, in fact, you, you had violated the rule. Gotcha. Allison, did you have anything to add to that? Oh, I was just going to add something. So the, the first question that we got related to, um, it was the question about how do large platforms ensure they're being COPPA compliant and specifically, um, there could be users who lie about their age. Um, and I just wanted to note that um, 
It, that is a, a reality. And I, I think, you know, there's only so much you can do about users who lie about their age, but the FTC has indicated in their um, COPPA FAQs that um, companies should take steps to avoid encouraging children to um, enter false age information. So, for example, um, by stating certain features of this app will not be available to users under 13, that's incentivizing a user to um, lie about their age. Um, and also, uh, the FTC has also recommended um, using a technical means, so um, a cookie or whatnot, to prevent uh, children from, from back buttoning and then entering um, a higher age once, at, you know, if they had initially entered a truthful under 13 age. Yeah, and I would just add to that that, um, uh, you know, we saw this at, when I was at the FTC, I continued to see it at KRU that yes, the FTC provides for a neutral, the use of a neutral age screen, but one, one needs to continually be thinking about what really is neutral in today's world. I mean, if kids, uh, if, if, if it looks like a jail that they have to evade to get to where they wanna go, it may not be neutral, even though it didn't tell them you must be 13. So you need to think about, um, you know, how you set these things up. You also need to think about if you are a mixed audience site. So in other words, you know, you've got, you know, millions of 14 to 18 year olds, uh, but you know, you also have younger children, 13 to 18 year olds, nine to 12 year olds, whatever. You can set up your offerings to offer different, you know, to take different measures depending on the age and that that is another way that um you can ensure that for the younger kids you're not you're not locking them out of a world they want to be in you are treating them as you're supposed to do by the law getting consent um so that's something i would you know i'd suggest that uh people look into as well which is um if you know you know if, if it's very likely that you've got kids on your site uh, think about whether or not you can uh, treat the under 13, uh, get parental consent, or put them in a world where you don't need consent, there's no collection, uh, and do differently with, with the older children. That, that is more like, you know, is perhaps less likely to induce as much age falsification by the kids. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think we're probably kind of down to our last one or two minutes, so maybe we don't we don't have quite have time for another question. But I wanted to hand it over to Allison to wrap up for us. Yeah, I want to thank everybody for attending today. I I want to thank Mamie and Allison for their remarks. Um, it was very very interesting um, hearing from both of you, um, myself, um, and I want to remind everyone that. Um, as I mentioned early on, if you are interested in seeing um, Pixelate's uh, free um, assessment of all the apps in the App Store and whether or not they have been assessed by our automated methodology as child directed or general audience, you can go to ratings.pixelate.com. Also wanted to mention that we will be at the IEPP conference April 12th and 13th, and I'll be doing a more detailed presentation about our new COPPA compliance tools um, at 1.15 on April 12th at the IEPP. So I'd really look forward to meeting any of you and, and talking further about that. Um, and also wanted to remind you about KRU's upcoming conference, which Mamie uh, mentioned. You can get more information about that on the KRU website. And I think that's it. Thank you all so much for your attendance today. Bye, thank you. Bye-bye, thank you.